and chant. I'll open with a chant from the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 12, the path of devotion. Arjuna vacha evam satyate yuktahaye bhaktastvam paripastate ye chapyaksharam avyaktam tesham ke yoga vittamaha sri bhagavan vacha maya veshamanoho yahe man Nitya yukta upasati Shraddhaya parayogaita Teme yukta tamamata Arjuna said, Some worship you with steadfast love. Others worship God the unmanifest and changeless. Which kind of devotee has the greater understanding of yoga? Sri Krishna replied, those whose minds are fixed on me in steadfast love, worshipping me with absolute faith, I consider them to have the greater understanding of yoga. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto us all. Today's topic is stages of interior prayer and the beautiful Gayatri mantra that Shibanwita chanted for us is one wonderful example of interior prayer. So what are the contributions of the world's major religious traditions? In Buddhism, we find it's, it's psychology and non-theistic tradition that appeals to even the atheistic practitioner. In Hinduism, the Vedanta philosophy correlates with modern physics and a sophisticated understanding of consciousness that appeals to modern day thinkers. Yoga Vedanta contributes an illuminating psychology, a psychology of the mind, which Buddhist, Buddhism then took and developed into its own uh, tradition. And within the various schools of yoga, Tantra and Vedanta, there's a rich variety of devotional practices and meditations. In the Christian tradition, it's just as it's prayer, it's prayer life, its greatest contribution to the world religions. In the way of a pilgrim, we find an Orthodox Christian classic. It's not of the Western Christianity, it's of the Orthodox Christian tradition. And it shows a beautiful story revealing the depth of the Hezekast method of prayer. And when I joined the Ramakrishna order, when I moved into the convent in 1971, it was included in Bellarmott's training center's lists of books monastics must read. So that shows you're getting the very best of that tradition. So what is the Hezekast method of prayer? That's from the Orthodox Christian tradition. And as we shall see, it's similar to the tantric sadhanas of japa and meditation. So let's deep dive. Tantra system of India developed a metaphysical, metaphysical system of shabda. Shabda, the principle of sound and sound Brahman. Shabda means that through sa the sound of the mantra, the sacred word Om, sh Shabda is the ladder that the aspirant ascends Godward. And through Svotavada, which in the Christian tradition translates as the Logos, the word, with a capital W, Sound is the channel through which God descends as man, through the avatar. And Christ is considered an avatar in our tradition. And Shabda Brahman is a metaphysical doctrine of creation. So let's take this apart. What is creation? Om is the source of the universe. And the descent of the mystic sound Om 
takes place as the gunas, these vibrational forces of prakriti that create this material universe, act and react against each other. Prana and akasha come together, there's an action, and the gunas create this creation. So in a manner of speaking, combination of sounds generate and recombine into compounded, com compounded sounds, as it were, that write the laws of this universe. Furthermore, sound known as Svotavata, Svotavata is the basis, basis of the avatar. In the Rig Veda, there's a very poetic translation. We read, in the beginning was Brahman, with whom was the word, and the word was verily the supreme Brahman. In the Gospel of St. John, Svota refers to the Logos, capital L, the Logos, the basis of avatarhood of Jesus Christ. It reads, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word was made flesh. So let's delve into the science of the mantra. Some of you have mantras. Some of you don't or may be interested in the mantra science. Shabda is the power of the name with a capital N. It materializes the form of God. This is an actual experience that mystics have. For example, religious songs, as in the Gayatri mantra that was beautifully chanted, materialize the object of our devotion. Now, you may ask, how is that so? How does that happen? Well, we see in Sri Ramakrishna's life how devotional songs could evoke within him the vision of that particular form of God eulogized and transport him into samadhi. Not just with him, but with Holy Mother, the direct disciples. And we find that with the disciples of the direct disciples as well. The Bija mantra, the seed word, that represents the chosen ideal of God, as it were, reshapes, purifies, and transforms the mind, wherein the form of the chosen ideal is summoned and appears to the aspirant. And I have seen this in monastics and lay devotees as well, and especially at the moment of death where God appears, the Lord that has been invoked through the mantra appears to the devotee. Now in the Christian classic, The Way of the Pilgrim, and I think you would find it really a good read, the pilgrim traveled across the steppes of 19th century Russia before the liberation of the serfs. And one day the peasant heard St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians being read from the church pulpit. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. And he wondered how he could learn to do this. So he left home. He came to a monastery where he met a staritz who became his spiritual teacher. And he taught him the secret of prayer. In his words, the continuous interior prayer of Jesus in a constant, uninterrupted calling upon the divine name of Jesus with the lips, in the spirit, in the heart, while forming a mental picture of his constant presence and imploring his grace during every occupation, at all times, in all places, even during sleep. The appeal is couched in these terms, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. One who accustoms himself to this appeal experiences as a result so deep a consolation and so great a need to offer the prayer always that he can no longer live without it and it will continue to voice itself within him of its own accord. So this 
launched the peasant on a pilgrimage into the heart of the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And since this is the Christmas season, it seemed appropriate to actually refer to this particular Christian classic in connection with our own tradition of mantra japa. Now the pilgrim came face to face with hurdles, spiritual milestones. He met with obstacles, remedies, and underwent stages of prayer. The, the pilgrim's rapid success, it was possible. Swami Brahmananda once said, self-effort is absolutely necessary for success in spiritual life. He instructed his disciples to follow spiritual disciplines for three years. He said, if you find no tangible progress, you may come back and slap my face. Even one year of steady practice will bear some result. And his teachings, The Eternal Companion, uh, are also on the training center's list of books that are a must read for the monastics of our order. And they're also a must read for devotees who are really serious about spiritual life. So what was the pilgrim's first obstacle? Laziness and boredom. So we can, we can identify with that. What is the prescription? To bring his mantra, his prayer forward. Now, what does that mean? Nicephorus and the Philokalia, another Christian classic, a spiritual text of teachings from the Hesychast Eastern Orthodox tradition of the fourth to the 15th century explained. If after a few attempts, you do not succeed and reaching the realm of your heart in the way you have been taught, do what I am about to say. The faculty of pronouncing words lies in the throat. He goes on, reject all other thoughts and allow that faculty to repeat only the following words constantly. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Compel yourself to do it always. If you succeed for a time, then without a doubt, your heart will also open to prayer. We know it from experience. So those of you who practice japa and meditation, you can begin to draw parallels. How much japa did the pilgrim perform? How many rounds of japa? How many repetitions? The starets first prescribed 3,000 japa a day. Then it went on to 6,000 japa a day. And finally, 12,000 japa a day. Now in our Ramakrishna Vedanta tradition, monastics and some devotees who are living a celibate life are prescribed this practice. It's called Purascharna. And it is a practice, a vow you take, and for the monastic, with the blessings of the monastic community, you accelerate the japam according to the phases of the moon until it reaches full moon, 15,000 japa, and then you decrease to 1,000 at new moon. And this can go on for a year, depending on how you take your vow, two years, three years, even longer. But again, it has to come with the blessings of the community around you. Because at that time, the aspirant is under a tremendous amount of tension, internal and external, because the progress is speeded up. So here we find with the pilgrim, if the pilgrim stopped for a moment, and this was in the initial stage of 3000 japa, he felt he had lost something. Swami Brahmananda said, in the beginning of spiritual life, it is very good to plan a definite routine. And the guru always explains this to the disciple. When to meditate, usually at the Brahma Murta, at dawn, at two hour period at dawn, and at sunset, when nature is at its stillest. And for the monastic community, also there is a worship at noon. 
A certain length of time, Brahmananda said, should be given to the practices of meditation, japa, and study. Whether you like it or not, follow your routine regularly. By so doing, you will gradually create a permanent habit. Perhaps now you do not enjoy meditating, but as you for perform the habit, you will come to the point where you will actually feel unhappy if you do not meditate. When you reach this stage, you will know that you have advanced along the spiritual path. And in our tradition, if in fact we reach an obstacle where we stop meditation, we do not prepare ourselves for the day with the daily meditation, we feel we are out of sync. It's an actual feeling. You feel you are out of sync. And so what is the antidote for laziness? Our teachers tell us, Christian and Vedantin, practice the quality that you desire. For boredom, practice enthusiasm. In the art of prayer, another Christian classic, we find, and I quote, always prayer, pray as if beginning for the first time. When we do a thing for the first time, we come to it fresh and with newborn enthusiasm. If when starting to pray, you always approach it as though you have never yet prayed properly and only now for the first time wish to do so, you will always pray with a fresh and lively zeal. So that's a preparation that has to come from us. We have to almost pretend like we are enthusiastic, try to generate within ourselves that enthusiasm. One of the first stages of interior prayer or mental japa is regularity of practice. The mind gets used to gather itself inward during specific hours of prayer. Those that I shared with you at the Brahma Murta in the early hours of the dawn and in the evening hours at sunset. Sarada Devi, the Holy Mother, spoke to Swami Atulananda, Guru Das Maharaj, the first Western monk who became a saint in our order. She said, repeat the mantra at all times, but for fast results, meditate at set times. Concentrate then on the meaning of the mantra. So the advantage of these set times is that the mind, whether you know it or not, is preparing itself to meditate. I give the example sometimes of a practice that we did in the Santa Barbara convent uh, of reading the Chandi in the morning before the, the shrine was open for the, for the other sisters. There would be a group of us who would go down and, and it takes about an hour and a half uh, to offer food and flowers and then read the whole thing orally. It has to be read orally. And in Santa Barbara, we have watchdogs and Martha, was our, one of our German shepherd watchdogs, very smart. And she would accompany her mom down to the shrine and she would sit outside the shrine. And then at the end of the hour and a half, she would accompany her, her mom nun back to her room. Well, at one time we decided we would change uh, from Tuesday morning both Tuesday and Saturdays are especially auspicious to the Divine Mother, to Saturday. So what happened on Tuesday morning? Martha walked herself down to the little shrine and sat at the designated time. And at the end of that time, she walked herself back to her mother's room. So in that way, the mind also prepares itself for the act of meditation. It's gathering its forces, whether we know it or not. And so much of the effort is happening internally even without our notice when we develop that habit. So what is the meaning of the mantra? It's our chosen ideal, <clears throat> whatever that may be. Sarada Devi, after coming down from a high state of samadhi said, I see that Sri Ramakrishna has become all this, meaning the universe, and everything within it. Now she meditated on Sri Ramakrishna. He was 
her lord, her master, her husband, her consort, whether in an ant or a stone, there was Sri Ramakrishna's presence. So each ishta, each chosen ideal, is the whole of reality. And it's usually an avatar. Uh, in the Vedanta Tantric tradition, usually the uh, form of God is given either Sri Ramakrishna, Holy Mother, Christ, Buddha, Rama, Krishna. So regularity of practice leads to constant recollectedness. Peter the Damascene in the Philokalia, yet another beautiful Christian classic, said, one must learn to call upon the name of God more even than breathing at all times, in all places, in every kind of occupation. So in other words, if we're making something, we remember the maker. If we see light, we remember the giver. If we're dressing, we remember whose gift our garment is. Swami Brahmananda emphasized this easy path of yoga, which is called Sahaja Yoga. What is that? Constant recollectedness. We can do this anywhere. Maharaj used to say, make japam, repeat the name of the Lord. Whatever you do, let the name of God flow like a current within you. Swami Shivananda, another direct disciple of Ramakrishna, continued for some time regular practice, he said, is conducive to the establishment of a constant spiritual mood, giving one a taste of inner joy. He said, a person should not leave his seat immediately after meditation, but should sit for a while thinking about the object of meditation. Then he may recite prayers and hymns to stabilize the meditative mood and inner joy. Practice like this, he said, fosters a continuous undercurrent of meditation, helping to keep the mind on a high level and bringing to the heart great joy. So there's a science to this practice of prayer and meditation and japa. Then comes the next stage, the prayer passes from the lips to the heart, not the anatomical heart, but the spiritual heart. Deep within, five fingers spans up from the navel and near the spinal column, the Hridaya Akasha. Mantra Shakti is what it is called in our tradition, automatic japam, a normal Unconscious acts become infused with the consciousness of the mantra. This is an actual experience. And here the pilgrim began to experience the prayer came with each beat of the heart, as it were. The first beat was Lord, the second beat was Jesus, and so on. His eyes could see into the heart, and he found his mind listened to this prayer. So this is an internal experience. It's a joyous experience. Along with that came a greater insight while reading the Philokalia. So with spiritual experience, the mind becomes more luminous and, this, and the content of the scriptures become much more awakened to us. And he also began to have dreams of his starets who taught him in his dreams. And this also happens in our tradition as well, where the guru comes and gives spiritual counsel through dream. Tapas literally means to generate heat. Now the pilgrim's joy was a warmth that spread throughout his whole breast. It was something that was felt. Swami Prabhavananda described to a disciple this experience of what we call mantra shakti during his 1936 pilgrimage to India. He said, I felt a great upliftment there. The whole atmosphere, this was in Vrindavan, 
is surcharged with a sweet feeling of love. It affected me a little like an intoxicating drink. We were there for four nights, and the peculiarity of the place is that the tongue began to utter the name of the Lord without any attempt on my part. And it went on all the while, except when I was sleeping. I thought what a blessed state it was. But as soon as I left the place, the intoxication was over. Now, this is the magic of Vrindavan. This is the magic of any vortex of spirituality, like Vrindavan, Banaras, etc., where there is something special. There is an undercurrent that helps our sadhana. And in this case, it produced mantra shakti. Now we come to regularity of practice. This regularity leads to constant recollectedness. In this stage, the prayer slips into the unconscious. The starets taught desire for prayer, japam, like a wheel which one gives a drive. Works by itself for some time, but to continue it must be oiled. Then when the wheel turns, then the wheel turns while even asleep. Swami Shivananda said, practice constant recollection and contemplation of God. One has to form the habit. Remember and think of him continually. While walking, eating, lying down, even while you are actively busy. This is karma yoga. Let it be as if an undercurrent is all the time flowing. So we are forcing the wheel by making the effort. And then the wheel begins to move of its own. He said, if you practice in this manner for a while, remembrance and contemplation of him will go on unconsciously within you. You will be repeating his name even while asleep. So now the pilgrim increased his japam to 12,000 a day. What happened at that time? The prayer woke him up in the morning. He dreamt he was saying the Jesus prayer. The prayer took on its own life. His experience was of joy and fulfillment. In the Song of Solomon, we read, I sleep, but my heart waketh. So this we find in the great saints in our tradition as well. So the quality of dreams changed at this time. He would have visitations. The guru or God appears in one's dream, instructs, comforts, protects, illumines. The pilgrim dreamt in the starrets hut he was receiving instruction. He dreamt he was in the hut. In the dream, he picked up the philokalia and searched for a passage, and the starrets took a charcoal and marked the passage. This was his dream. When the pilgrim awoke, he found the philokalia beside his bed. He opened to the chapter marked with the charcoal. The charcoal was lying beside his bed. How do we explain such phenomenon that seems so fantastic? Swami Brahmananda said at one time, show me the line of demarcation where matter ends and spirit begins. The next stage is spiritual awakening. It can be gradual or sudden. The pilgrim's awakening came when he was overwhelmed with bliss. He acknowledged, I knew the meaning of the words, the kingdom of God is within you. And we hear this all the time. But to have that experience is something else altogether. What is this first experience? A disciple of Swami Brahmananda once revealed, he is right here within. He is, no doubt anymore. Sat, existence. This is felt. He is chid, consciousness. Ananda, your heart melts in love. So no prayer fails in God's eyes. There are two effects of prayer. 
happiness and dullness. Now, how can that be? We find that light, warmth, joy bring reward and consolation. Heaviness, darkness, dryness bring us cleansing and strengthening. And the Christian mystics call this the dark night of the soul. That is when we struggle the most. It can be the death of a loved one. It can be a tragedy in one's life. It can be any number of things that bring us sorrow and force us to increase our sadhana, force us to increase our prayer life. And that brings speedy results. The pilgrim understood from Jeremiah 18.7, the clay is completely in the hand of the potter. So whether we're going through bliss or depression, we're in the hand of the potter. We can choose to make our experiences our sadhana or to avoid them. It's up to us. So there's a twofold power of prayer. It guards the mind and cleanses the heart. Swami Shivananda. If one but takes to meditation and japa and prays to him constantly, one's mental tendencies get the proper direction and one's senses come under control. So the secret is that the greater the obstacle, the greater the power to overcome the obstacle. Yes, that power then is summoned from within us. And with that comes spiritual power. And in the process, prayer actually transfigures the human body. In the Mahanirvana Tantra, when we receive the mantra, we're no longer a human being. We have become godlike. We are born in spirit. You know, when I was in the convent, uh, Swami Prabhavananda in Santa Barbara, Swami Prabhavananda would come twice a month, stay for five days at a time. And his attendant, Swami Krishnananda, who was very elderly, probably as old as Swami, maybe a little bit younger, but he was elderly for me. I was a young person in my 20s. He was elderly. Um, physically, he was a Harvard graduate, but you would never know that. He was so humble. His whole sadhana was, of course, japa. He did what is called Lakita japa. When he passed away, we found in his bedroom notebooks of the name of God written line after line. We could hear him doing his rosary. His rosary was, it was very loud when he made japa on his rosary. And the unusual thing about him was that his sadhana was attending to Swami Prabhavananda. And he was so excelled in that area of sadhana, he knew what the Swami would need before he even asked for it. I remember one day, when he drove Swami up to Santa Barbara, Swami needed, he needed a special kind of lamp or something. He didn't have enough light. And Swami Krishnananda went to his car and just opened the trunk and pulled out the lamp that he would need. So he was that. So you understand that he was very saint-like, but physically, he was very ugly. Feature for feature, he was very ugly. But there was such a luminosity in his face that he was beautiful. He was absolutely beautiful. He reminds me of Brother Lawrence uh, in that Christian classic. He would always be doing the dishes in the kitchen as we were finishing our meals in the dining hall with the Swami. He was always working and always in that, but the, the, the luminosity in his face changed his appearance. So this, as, as the aspirant uses the mantra, the physical body becomes transformed into what is called a love body. And you can read this in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. He said, God cannot be seen with these physical eyes. In the course of spiritual discipline, one gets a love body 
endowed with love eyes, love ears, and so on. With this love body, the soul communes with God. In other words, the kundalini rises and the third eye opens. And the body and mind are transformed. To transfigure ourselves, we must work like the pilgrim. To unfold the power of the name, we read, it is not enough to possess prayer. We must become prayer. We must become prayer. Like a drop of ink that falls on blotting paper, the act of prayer should spread steadily outwards from the conscious and reasoning center of the brain until it embraces every part of ourselves. To become saturated with the power of the name. And we see in the life of the pilgrim that Jesus' prayer also warded off obstacles. When the body was cold, the pilgrim prayed more earnestly and the heat of tapas warmed his body. Tapas literally means to generate heat. When hungry, he called upon God more often. When rheumatic pain beset him, he fixed his thoughts on prayer. When insulted, he became absorbed in the sweetness of the name. Swami Shraddhananda, disciple of Swami Shivananda and the former head of the Vedanta Society of Sacramento, wonderful holy man, and an adept in japa and meditation. These old swamis would come and visit us in our convent in Southern California and in the Hollywood Center as well. And we in turn, several of us in the convent would visit him um, uh, on our pilgrimages. Um, he wrote a beautiful book called Seeing God Everywhere and I looked for it in our book stall. We're out of it right now, but I'm going to order it for you. It's a beautiful book on mantra and japa and the secrets that come with the process of using the mantra and japa. Mantra is likened to medicine injected into our bloodstream. It cures the disease of the world. When we direct the mantra to the body, the mind, the senses, it removes the afflictions. And this is not just a matter of speaking. This is an actual physical thing we can do with the mantra, direct it to various places within ourselves. Another method of spiritual transfiguration through prayer is that we forget the body, mind, and senses. And as we become more absorbed in japa and meditation, this is what happens. Swami Prabhupada explained, remember that our Lord is the sanctuary. Practice that attitude, then the mind will go naturally to the Lord. Make a habit of placing a part of the mind in the center of your heart, in the presence of the Lord. If you do that in times of stress, the mind will automatically go there. And what he means by the heart, of course, is the Hridaya Akasha, the cave of the heart, five finger spans up from the navel near the, spine, near the spinal column. He went on, practice Japa more and more, and you are sure to find the inexpressible joy, the joy that knows no limit. Until you are established in that, there will be ups and downs, but do not lose heart. The days you feel dry within, you need more strenuous struggle to meditate. You may not come out of the dryness while you are striving, but as an after effect of that, you will see how your whole being is responding to the bliss of God, even while you are not expecting it. So the results, in other words, sometimes come later, but this is all a result of the sadhana of japa. Prayer empowers the rosary, our japa mala, we call it, and in the Christian tradition, it's the rosary. The pilgrim story is that in the winter evening, he was walking through a forest and a wolf left out at him. He was armed with his starrets woolen rosary. And the pilgrim swung it at the wolf 
and it was torn out of his hands and caught on a bough of a dead tree. It happened to become twisted around the wolf's neck, which was a fluke. The pilgrim took the rosary, the wolf snapped it and fled. Then the pilgrim met an old man in a nearby village who explained, what is the meaning of sanctity? When the soul becomes holy, the body becomes holy also. The rosary has always been in the hands of a sanctified person. The effect of the contact of his hands and the exhalation of his body was to inoculate it with holy power, the power of the first man's innocence, what we would say would be the first man's purity. So the guru always takes the mantra japa, mala, and performs japa on it and then hands it to the disciple. There's a beautiful parallel to this story in our tradition. Swami Brahmananda related in Vrindavan, an aged old holy man in the, the, of the Vaishnava sect was sitting in one corner of the Krishna temple, counting his beads. Suddenly he turned to Maharaj and beckoned him to approach, indicating with an affectionate gesture that he should sit down with him. And so the two began to meditate. As Maharaj became absorbed, he felt the Vaishnava touch his head with his beads. He did this repeatedly. And each time as Brahmananda received the saint's touch, the hair on his body stood on end and he experienced an ecstatic joy. The Jesus prayer is equivalent to mantra japa. It transfigures, it empowers, it protects. It is a path to mukti. The name of God is this, is, comes through spiritual experiences that the pilgrim received and experienced. And it tally, tallies with those that we find in our own tradition. The pilgrim described the Jesus prayer, the radiant name, he called it. Japa brought light, the light of pure consciousness. It increased the pilgrim's capacity to understand the scriptures. It brought a luminosity to the mind. He said, I could easily grasp and dwell upon matters of which up to now I had not been able even to think of. So these qualities come to us also as we practice with regularity, japam, and meditation, our sadhana and study. A common revelation is that when we read the same scripture, a deeper meaning from a passage suddenly dawns upon us. An overlooked passage strikes us for the first time. Our teachers explain this is a sign of spiritual progress. The pilgrim understood also the speech of all beings. This came from his sadhana. Even animals, now you might think, oh, this is incredible. But we find in Sri Ramakrishna's life, when his yogic senses were heightened, Swami Sardananda explained in the great master, that wonderful biography of Sri Ramakrishna, the master heard arising naturally and unceasingly everywhere in the universe, the Anahata Dwani, the great Pranava sound, which is the aggregate of all the different sounds of the universe. Some of us heard this from the master himself and also heard him say that he could at that time understand the meaning of the cries of all animals. We find this in St. Francis's life as well, an incredible luminary. He could speak and listen to the animals. It is a yogic power. In the tantric mantra shastras, we find that the guru empowers the mantra, that the guru lives in the mantra. Now in our tradition, who is the guru? The guru is Sri Ramakrishna. All of the mantras in our tradition come, are handed down from Sri Ramakrishna to Holy Mother, to the direct disciples. 
and to the disciples of the direct disciples and so forth. So the, the mantras are coming from Sri Ramakrishna. Swami Satprakashananda told one disciple, and Satprakashananda, he actually saw Vivekananda when he was a boy, a young man. He was initiated by one of the direct disciples. He was the founder of the Vedanta Society of St. Louis, where our Swami Chaitananda is now. And he's a great scholar. You can read his books, Methods of Knowledge. He's an incredible scholar. My teacher, Swami Prabhupada always referred to him uh, for any, any kind of scholarly question. He was considered a real master. And he was a holy man. He once told this disciple, when a disciple repeats his mantra, a thread of golden light of consciousness connects the heart of the disciple to the heart of the guru. As Swami was telling this, an elder disciple suddenly saw a thread of golden light connecting his heart to his guru's heart. I heard this story from one, uh, from a very senior monk in our order who heard it firsthand. The pilgrim also had the experience awakened, of the guru awakened in the mantra. He said, I felt the action of the prayer in my heart Suddenly, I saw something flash quickly before my eyes, in the air as it were, like the figure of my departed starets. I started, and so as to hide the fact, I said, excuse me, I must have dropped, dropped to sleep for a moment. Then I felt as though the soul of my starets made its way into my own or gave light to it. I felt a sort of light in my mind and a number of ideas about prayer came to me. So we then become the commentator of the scriptures. Our mind becomes illumined, it becomes luminous. We begin to see into the depths of these wonderful passages from the Upanishads, from the Gita, from other holy scriptures. So this repetition of the Jesus prayer also brings a spirit of detachment. In the Vedanta tradition, we would call this the adoitic witness state of consciousness. An example of this was the pilgrim's calm reaction to an unchain, unfortunate chain of circumstances. There was a devoted young girl who one day, she was a disciple of the pilgrim, pursued him and begged to be saved from marriage and she begged to be placed in a convent. But the pilgrim was at a loss of what to do. So now this pilgrim, the disciple, had now become a teacher. Suddenly, several men drove, drove up in a carriage. They seized the girl and the pilgrim. The girl was sent back to her parents, and the pilgrim was brought to trial for ab attempted abduction. In the pilgrim's own words, Early in the morning, two country policemen came, flogged me, and drove me out of the village. I went off thanking God that he counted me worthy to suffer for his name. This comforted me and gave still more warmth and glow to my ceaseless interior prayer. He went on. None of these things made me feel at all cast down. It was as though they happened to someone else and I merely watched them. Even the flogging was within my power to bear. The prayer brought sweetness into my heart and made me unaware, so to speak, of anything else. Here we're reminded of a story Sri Ramakrishna used to tell in the Gospel of Ramakrishna. Once upon a time, there was a pious weaver but there was a band of robbers who wanted someone to carry their stolen goods. So they commanded the weaver to carry them. The police arrived, the robbers ran away, and the weaver was jailed and brought before the magistrate. When he was asked to explain himself, he simply related to the magistrate, by the will of Rama, robbers dragged me with them. By the will of Rama, they robbed, by the will of Rama, the police came. By the will of Rama, I was jailed. By the will of Rama, I am standing before you, the magistrate. 
In other words, the weaver was absorbed in the witness consciousness, experiencing this world as a dream. The pilgrim saw God within and without. He experienced Christ's dictum, love thy neighbor as thyself. The Holy Father, Nicetus Stetatus, I'm probably butchering his name, explained, he who has attained to true prayer and love has no sense of the difference between things. He does not distinguish the righteous man from the sinner, but loves them all equally and judges no man as God causes his sun to shine, in other words, the light of the Atman, and his rain to fall, in other words, the law of karma, on the just and the unjust. <clears throat> Swami Brahmananda once said to Swami Prabhavananda, there are times when it becomes impossible for me to teach anyone. No matter where I look, I see only God wearing many masks. Who am I, the teacher? Who is to be taught? <clears throat> How can God teach God? But when my mind comes down again to a lower level, I see the ignorance in man, and I try to remove it. So this mantra sadhana reveals Brahman with eyes open. We find this in the Upanishadic revelation. Enjoy springs this universe, enjoy dwells this universe, and enjoy dissolves this universe. This is the experience of ananda, bliss absolute. The pilgrim shared, the whole world outside also seemed to me full of charm and delight. Everything drew me to love and thank God, people, trees, plants, animals. I saw them all as my kinsfolk. I found on all of them the magic of the name of Jesus. And we see this holy communion with plants and animals vividly exemplified in the life of St. Francis of Assisi. And if you have never gone to Assisi, it is really worth going. I was very, very fortunate to spend a, a week there in a cottage owned by a devotee who was one of the founders of the Holland Center, Holland Vedanta Center. It is like a Benares or a Bindavan. The whole village of Assisi is suffused with an atmosphere like we find in Bindavan. And when you leave Assisi, you feel that presence leaves as well. So it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. Sri Ramakrishna's experience was the deity in the Kali temple revealed to him, was revealed to him as pure spirit. The utensils of worship on the altar, the doorframe, all pure spirit. The people, animals, other living beings, all pure spirit. Sri Ramakrishna later related, like a madman, I began to shower flowers in all directions. Whatever I saw, I worshipped. One day, during the worship of Shiva, he was about to offer a bell leaf on the head of the image, and it was revealed that this Varat, this universe itself, is Shiva. Another day, when he was plucking flowers, it was revealed that the flower, flowering plants were so many bouquets of offerings. So in conclusion, this holy time, the way of the pilgrim is a way to enter, enter the kingdom of heaven. And how can we apply this to our lives? Swami Vigyanananda said to Swami Shivananda, where will you go after passing? Swami Shivananda answered, Ramakrishna Loka. Swami Vigyanananda said, to keep constant recollectedness of him here and now is Ramakrishna Loka in this world while living. So by repeating the name of Christ, remembering him constantly, the pilgrim entered the kingdom of heaven within, the Christ Loka while living. As a senior monk of the Ramakrishna 
once revealed, when you are doing japa or meditating, you are already in the presence of the ishta. That itself is its fulfillment. And now we will have